Hi, Bob Giddings here from Hokusei Gakuen Junior College. And this is part of a series why I'm going back over some presentations that I've made in the past and just recording a, um, a uh, voiceover to upload to YouTube to make some of the information and the presentations available in a very casual way. So today's my topic is CLIL separate mediation and the integration of non-target language input in the design of learning and assessment tasks. The pink elephant in the ecology of the EFL classroom. That's a really long title. Um, and let's look at it bit by bit. First of all, this uh, presentation was given during an online conference, the practice, the practice of teaching, learning and assessment with Sefer and, and Clil um, in October of 2020. And it was a joint event of the of uh, the Japan Association of Language Teachers, the Sefer and Language Portfolios uh, Special Interest Group, and also Jolt Akita a chapter of uh, local chapter of Jolt, and was sponsored by Akita International University. So first of all, what's CLIL? CLIL is well content and language integrated learning. Now, I have not yet been able to find an agreed upon definition of CLIL, but CLIL came out as a term in the 1990s to describe a mix of language teaching and content teaching that was becoming more and more popular around the world, especially in Europe. Now, this picture, since I'm from Hokkaido in Japan, and I'm, I love history. This is a picture of the founder of one of the major enterprises of CLIL in Hokkaido, Clark Sensei, William Smith Clark. He came from um, Massachusetts in the United States to Japan to establish Sapporo Agricultural College in the 1870s and classes they were taught in English, but also there were classes taught um, about English to improve the students English. So this one, he's mostly famously known for his statement to the Japanese uh, college students, boys be ambitious. And you can find someone, at least of my generation, who has heard of this famous quote any, all over Japan. Now, what he was doing, it could be considered CLIL by some definitions, or it could be um, considered EMI, English uh, Media Immer um, Instruction. So his focus and the focus of support agricultural school in the 1870s was mostly on teaching agriculture, but English was only the vehicle for doing that. So. Um, you could also call what what they were doing that back then in the 1870s hard clill, with that's mainly a focus on the on the content. Soft clill, um, on the other hand, would be mainly a focus on language and using the content only as a vehicle to learn the the language uh, points. So um, long long ago, we had. We, we, we consider we have CLIL. Some people believe that um, CLIL goes back to the times of the Akkadian Empire in the Middle East. Um, but CLIL is basically teaching school subjects or content to people, but not in their native language. For example, Smith Sensei taught Japanese students about agriculture in English. Um, the language of schooling is also the target language of the educational program. And it's usually this is not just, um, uh, the language of schooling is not just the content of lectures, but overall the, um, the ecology of the classroom, the ecology of the school has the target language um, as an important um, part of the educational program.
So my school, Hoxha Gakuen Junior College, has been doing something like CLIL since the 1990s, since 1994. Um, uh, we, we, our second year students, first year students learn general English in um, sort of poor skills. Second year students apply that knowledge by taking four um, general studies classes like history or biology or um, literature in English. So this is a, a little bit of a, a very much of an aside, but my first experience, if we take Phil in a very broad sense, was my third year high school French class in 1968. We got a new teacher. He had never taught before. And we were, had only studied um, French for three years and, and none of us could, do, could speak it or read it very well, but he decided to teach French through literature. And I'm not sure if you're uh, familiar with, with uh, the novels, he chose three novels for us. One was by Albert Camus, La Peste, and which is, has a very heavy theme of the plague breaking out in an Algerian town. Another one was Les Fourmonieurs by Gide, André Gide, a uh, thick book. I think there's probably almost 300 pages. And uh, it also has a slight homoerotic theme. And then he chose another book by Marcel Proust. Which I can't remember the, the ex exact title, but I remember it was a thick book and very, very heavy to carry around. I struggled with these three novels, which were way beyond my capacity. But somehow, I just barely passed French. Now, in doing so, I used a tool that the teacher was perhaps not glad that I found. If you're as old as me, you can remember, you probably remember the series, um, at least in the United States, of Cliff's Notes, a very short paperback that outlined important uh, important uh, uh, works of literature. And it gave, it gave me all the things I needed to know about uh, what uh, Camus was trying to make a point of in his uh, novel, the, the Pest, The Plague in English. Unfortunately, the books by Gide and Proust did not have Cliff's Notes, so I struggled. But why I bring this up is that um, Thinking about, um, thinking about um, Clil, I want to ask the question, is Clil instruction all, all in, in, the, in the target language possible? Now here, the target language was French. Um, for many people listening to this, it, may be, it will probably be another language. Is target language instruction all, 100% target language instruction possible? The other question I want to ask is 100% target language um, based CLIL learning possible? I want to say no to that because the students, as did I, in this case with my clips notes, bring our own resources into the classroom. We'll get back to that in a little bit later. So second, what is mediation? The mediation is um, helping people to understand stuff they don't know, but they want to know it, they need to know it, uh, but, they, but they don't have access to it. Uh, maybe because it's in a different language, maybe because the, the concepts are too difficult, maybe they can't see it if it's, a, if it's a visual image that they need to have access to. It could be for any reason. Um, so the actor or the student well, it's, is a social, has a social role to play between two things, the people who need the knowledge and the people who are providing the knowledge or the text um, or information that is providing the knowledge. Now this can be explaining a joke that someone from another culture doesn't understand, using Google at a party to settle an argument. And many, many of us have done that. A researcher working from facts, which she or he goes through 
to find only the facts that they need to explain something to um, their audience. So giving directions to a tourist. And students doing a pair work gap exercise in a language class. One student has the information, the other student needs to find what it is and write it into their gap. So uh, mediation has a, a very, very broad, broad um, range of meanings. And basically almost everything a teacher does is me involves mediation. We mediate constantly as teachers, explaining things to our students, making things easy for them to understand. Um, it could be so many different things. And we do this not just as language teachers, but also as, as teachers of, of content as well. So um, mediation. This comes from um, a Cambridge uh, video series online. Um, mediation is a complex process where the learner acts as a social agent who creates bridges and helps to construct or convey meaning, sometimes within the same language, sometimes between, uh, sometimes from one language to another. So how many times have you mediated today? How about this week in your life? Um, there's so, mediation is just a simple part of human existence of explaining things to people or translating for people or um, things like that. So mediation itself is not a language skill. And the um, recent, recently in 2008 and 2019, the Sefer the Companion volume has focused on um, some new aspects of language learning, including mediation a little more strongly than the original Sefer volume. So mediation itself is not a language skill, but something we need to do to communicate successfully. And basically, Sefer now breaks down skills, language skills into two general areas, receptive skills, and receptive skills would be like listening and reading, or product, production skills. Production skills, of course, would be speaking or writing. Now, Sefer is inherently, when, they, when Sefer looks at language and, and, and when the, the can-do statements uh, try to explain uh, students' experiences with language, Sefer is inherently looking at communication as the main place where language takes place. And so this communication, this interaction between people people using listening, reading, writing, and, and, um, and speaking, lets communication happen, the interaction. Now, mediation takes this a little bit further because mediation, and mediation, is the, the mediator or the student is not face-to-face -face communicating with only one person. The mediator is going between two things. Now, this could be a, a, a written document that the mediator will, mediator will explain to someone who doesn't understand the, the language of the document. It can be anything like that, but medi mediation uses the receptive skills, the productive skills, the interaction, the interactive skills of um, based in, in good human communication. And then it adds to that. It takes it to the next step of being um, creating a bridge or of understanding between two, two groups or two pieces of information. Okay, so mediation strategies. Um, these are uh, from a simple separate diagram from the companion volume, explaining a new concept or simplifying a text. And there are so many different things we can do. This is basically, does this sound like you're teaching? If we, so basically, if we want our students to become involved in learning those advanced mediation uh, strategies or skills, um, we just encourage them to teach each other or to explain something to each other and we have it made. It's, it can be very simple. This can be from their first language to the target language or L2. It can be from L2 to L1. 
It can be from L3 or L4 to uh, any language they, they, they can access to a language that uh, the person or the group needing the information can access. So Sefer looks at this not by thinking of target language or non-target language or native language, but is looking at this from a plurilingual point of view, basically a European point of view, where many people in the population can speak several languages. So it can also be from um, the target language to the target language, or from the native language to the native language, depending on the case. All of these kind of uh, places are places in our communication lives where mediation can take place. So what's mediation? And um, uh, let me give you just a practical example. And um, it's not the same as translation. If we, if we use mediation, the concept allows us to use um, or put, not allows, but focuses our attention on the use of the student's languages. They have the languages the students have access to, including their na native language, to as as uh, tools or vehicles to explain things to a third party. And um, this is an example of a friend in a French restaurant reading mediation through two different languages. So, um, and it comes from um, Victoria Clark. Uh, a web series, a webinar series she did in 2020. And one of the parts of the series is interaction and mediation and language assessment. Now, her example was fantastic. So I'll, I'll steal it and just repeat it here. Um, she went with a friend to a French restaurant in France. Now, Clark since they can speak some French and read some French. So she was okay with the menu, but her friend didn't know a thing. Now, her friend needed help. Her friend needed mediation from the text on the menu to her friend's uh, a need for placing an order with the waiter or waitress. So translation was not really an option. Um, if you translated the menu, you would start with the name, then you'd say the address, and then you just read down, down, down. And people don't need to do that to complete the task of making an order. Now, Clark Sensei knew that her friend didn't like red meat and also heavy sauces were out. So what she did is she looked at the menu and she said, oh, here's a nice looking fish dish that I think has a very light and fresh sauce and it's called blah, blah, blah. Would you like to order it? And the friend said, oh, that sounds great. Yeah, let's order it. No translation, but taking the information as a mediator from the source and not deciding on your own what was um, what what was in the menu, but adapting, but looking at the menu from the needs of the person you are mediating for, her friend who didn't like red meat or heavy sauces. The, um, another uh, example she brings up in, in her um, uh, webinar is mediation within the same language. Now here we have a grandmother meeting her grandkids at the station after a long time. They're happy. They're carrying on. Suddenly they hear a message, and um, but the grandmother couldn't understand it because it was too noisy and she was paying attention to the kids. So uh, this is what we call mediation of te a text, like the menu. Well, the menu is a written text, but this is a spoken text the announcement in the station. Now, the grandmother knows your train going to, will be leaving on platform. <laughs> she, she missed the exact words. She doesn't know what to do. Um, so she doesn't have access to um, the name of, of the train or the platform it's gonna be on. But what she can do is the grandchild in the train station heard the message and can mediate to her grandmother in the same language. Grandma, it said the, the train to Bristol is leaving uh, in five minutes on track 23. 
let's hurry up, we have to make it. And they start running off. Um, so in this, in this case, mediation can happen in the same language. It can happen between French and um, the English of the, of the French restaurant menu. It can happen um, in many different ways, but the key thing is helping people to understand things that they don't know or need or want to know. Um, okay, let's go on to the ecology of the classroom. And the ecology of the classroom is, um, sometimes we think of the class, our, our lesson plans, and what the teacher wants the students to do and what the teacher is going to teach, the information the teacher brings out in, in, in um, shares with the student or explains to the student. But if we think of the ecology of the classroom, it's all of the things, both the teacher and students bring with them into the classroom environment. And this, uh, this uh, picture uh, is more fit for probably a boardroom than a classroom, but imagine it's like a seminar. Not just the teacher is going to be giving information, but all of the students are also involved in a discussion or sharing information they know about the topic. Now, in, in reality, just like in my French class, we all bring things into a classroom. And uh, I brought my cliff notes in English. But um, the other things we bring are our understanding of our cultures, of uh, past uh, information from, if we're talking about college, from high school. And students and teachers are all, in reality, social agents in the classroom, if we think of the ecology of the classroom. And especially if we think of Sefer, Sefer focuses on looking at language learning and teaching as um, an active process where the students are social agents communicating and also mediating in the classroom. So it's not just teacher-centered. And another way to look at this is we think of it, uh, teachers and um, students are co-creating knowledge together. And this is especially true if we have not just language, but also content in the classroom. So students bring in previous learned knowledge from L1. Maybe if it's history, a history is CLIL class, maybe from um, high school or junior high school history. The L2, the L1 tools, they've learned to find new content knowledge. Now this is similar to using Google in a party to solve an argument. Uh, we have we have online tools. We have this tools of learning, knowing how to use a dictionary or to search for a book in the library. Um, interviewing our grandparents if we need knowledge about history related to their their period or lives. The students' own life experience also is a very rich tool that all all of us students bring into the classroom, and then. So this is a very strange way to say it. It's a little bit grotesque, but I like to think of it as our students are swimming in a rich soup of L1 content knowledge um, that uh, they know a lot already about almost every general content class that's taught from their previous knowledge or from their life experience. So what's the elephant? Well, the elephant is always something, uh, the elephant in the room or the elephant in the classroom is something huge, something that is problematic, but something that everyone, it, everyone just ignores or doesn't see. And in this case, I'm suggesting the elephant is the student's L1. This is especially important when we think of mediation because mediation, the separate companion volume scales for mediation and the can-do statements suggest ways that um, human beings use not just the target language, but many other languages in performing tasks that are mainly based in the target language or in communicating with each other. So how can we use L1 in the classroom in a very positive way? And thinking of this, especially as mediation, um, so, um, so this non-target language, especially the student's native language or L1, um, 
let's get back to my question. Is CLIL monolingual? Particularly, is monolingual CLIL instruction possible? Now, instruction is from the student at the, at, the, at the lowest level, instruction is from, from the teacher to the student. So if the, stu if the teacher prepares materials all in the target language and only allows the students to speak in the target language during class, if all the reports are in the target language, in that sense, monolingual instruction is possible because it's thinking of the teacher controlling a situation top down. But is monolingual CLIL learning possible? And I want to say no, because if we look at um, learning from a Sefer perspective with students as social, active social agents in the classroom, if we look at the co-construction of knowledge as being essential, active learning as being essential, we have to take into account the things that students bring with them in any of the languages they speak, all of those experiences or learning, learning experiences bring with them into the classroom are also part of CLIL learning. So separate plus CLIL twists things by putting the focus on active learning students as social agents in, um, in the co-construction of content knowledge. So mediation gives us some conceptual tools to understand and integrate those plurilingual assets or in particular non-target language assets or students l1 into our syllabus so these are the categories for mediation and this is taken from a, a equals presentation uh it will be um it, I, i've listed in in my uh references meeting a text meeting mediation strategies mediating concepts and mediating mediating communication now, mostly I want to talk about mediating a text where the mediator will have a text, a spoken, um, a written um, text that they receive and mediate for a third party. So relaying specific information, explaining graphs, processing text, reading a, a text, um, and just taking the parts that are necessary for the third party, like the French menu, listening and note taking. This is mediating the teacher's, say, lecture for my own personal needs. Or maybe I'm taking notes for a friend. Expressing a personal response to artistic text, including literature. This one and the next are an analysis and criticism of artistic text. Bring into the the the, the scenario, not just um, not just factual information, but creative experience. That the, the receptive, the mediator is is experiencing a piece of art, a photograph, a literary work, a play, music, and somehow mediating the information or the feeling about that, that experience to a third party. So this brings, opens up a lot of possibilities for designing um, writing activities or any kind of activities or task prompts in, in uh, language learning. Meaning strategies, linking to a previous knowledge, elaborating a dense task, text, a text that's very difficult to understand, streamlining a text, which might be something like, um, outlining, breaking down complicated information, um, which would be very suitable, say, for explaining a graph, adapting language. Um, let's say you have to exp explain, um, let's say, let's say you go with your friend to talk to the doctor and the doctor, you, the doctor's, in my case, the doctor um, is speaking in Japanese and my friend is Japanese and English speaker. And my friend has to explain to me what did the doctor say about my disease. And now the doctor is going to be speaking doc J Japanese to my friend, but my friend has not just to translate because I don't understand either Japanese or English 
complex medical terminology. So my friend has to explain what the doctor says to me as if I were a six-year-old. Now that's the idea of adapting language. It can also involve register, politeness, and things like that. Mediating concepts is basically um, helping people to work together in a group, managing interaction, um, facilitating collaboration, and things like that. So this involves not just language skills, but also communicative skills, interpersonal communicative skills. Mediating communication, um, th the last category, also brings in uh, pluricultural space, mediating not um, just the, the, the group activity, but also going deeper with an understanding of the, the cultures of the various agents in, in the group. And um, also being a problem solver if there are any disagreements or delicate situations or disputes to deal with the group. So this is very, very much um, also not just focusing on language on, the, on the, the words and grammar, but on interpersonal communicative skills or intercultural communicative skills. <coughs> this is something that was present in the early Sefer um, descriptors, but has been made much, much, um, has been brought in more in, in, into the limelight in the Sefer companion volume. Okay, let's look at some um, mediation tasks for CLIL. This is a mediation task for geography, and um, it's for a class on, ge on taught in English and geography in Italy. The students can all speak Italian. And the task is um, to make a, a program for a day's outing with exchange students on the basis of Vesuvio's official tourist information website which is written only in Italian. So now, separate tasks, for the most part, will always involve active communication. And mediation will involve mediating from language A to language B, or the same language is OK. But in this case, uh, the receivers, or the, the, you could say the clients of the mediator, are the exchange students who want to go and see Vesuvio. And the mediator can speak both English and Italian, but she's looking on the Italian websites and looking for the information only that would be suitable for a day's excursion to Vesuvio for exchange students. So it narrows it down. And this is a case where the input for the, for the mediation um, communicative task, or the mediation task, language task, will be in one language, the student's L1, Italian, and the output will be in L2, English. OK, so basically, information only available in English is, in Italian is being processed so that English speakers can enjoy a tour of Vesuvius. And if you look, basically, um, the mediator, the woman in the center, is communicating with the student who wants to go on the tour, the man with the question mark, who doesn't know anything about the subio, and answering his questions or designing um, information that will, will suit his situation. OK. Basically, the exchange students say, I don't understand. This is all in Italian, but I want to go to Vesuvio. And the mediator is saying, I can help you understand. What do you want to know? And uh, he tells her, well, I want to do a day's uh, excursion to Vesuvio with, my, with two or three other exchange students that I'm uh, my friends. So the mediator does not translate the website. Um, she doesn't say what she thinks would be a good idea. She finds out from the, from the male student what he wants to do, a, an excursion for a day. And she works for that, for that male student who needs the information. He needs the information. Now, she might think, no way, Vesuvio, Vesuvio in one day? You're crazy. No, she doesn't say that. She says, oh, 
This will be in one day. Ah, okay. Let's see what we can find for you. Okay. So basically, this is the for designing mediation uh, tasks. Is this is the generic task prompt? Someone needs information or doesn't understand something. The mediator says, "Can you help me?" The mediator says, "Yes, okay, I can help you." The mediator then goes to the source of information, um, takes something in a text in language A, and helps someone to do something with it or understand it in language B. And Sefer is very sly about language A or language B. They can be different languages or the same language. They can be different le registers of the same language. They can um, be a cultural translation because of um, a cultural um, mediation because of different understandings in two different cultures of the information. So this, if we think about this generic task prompt, the mediator is in the middle, explaining something to someone who's in need. And we look back at the things we talked about before, mediating a text, relaying specific, specific information. When does the bus to Vesuvio depart? Explaining data in graphs, processing tasks, maybe listening, to, uh, to uh, Vesuvio's YouTube explanation of, of the main sites, taking some notes and showing them to the, to the exchange student who wants to go. Expressing a personal response to artistic text, maybe not, but maybe she knows um, uh, a poem about Vesuvio and she says, oh, this is really cool. You should listen to this. It would involve that too. Or maybe she experienced Vesuvio and she wants to also explain her feeling about Vesuvio or her enjoyment or, or dread of Vesuvio, but not because she wants to talk about herself, because she thinks this information, um, sharing this feeling can help the person who needs the mediation. Linking to previous knowledge, elaborating a dense text on the internet, streamlining a text, simplifying it, breaking down comp uh, complicated information, all of these things can be involved in the mediative task. So going back to this um, generic approach to a mediation task, the mediator takes something in a text in language A and helps someone do something with it or understand it in language B. Now again, a text can be um, a person's speech it can be a, a piece of music, it can be a written text, text. it can be a, a homepage, it can be a graph, it can be anything. And language A and language B are undecided. So what's a text in language A? As we said before, written, spoken, graphic, data chart, creative arts, life experience, any kind of input or output from that question mark spot. What's language A or language B? Two languages, same language, different registers, all the language the, po the participants can individually use. If we think about testing, we want to probably keep it to um, a language that we know the, uh, the students have access to naturally or from their previous learning um, or the target language. And output could be in the target language or vice versa. So teaching CLIL is mostly mediation because we're taking complex concepts from a content area and explaining them in a language that is not the student's uh, main language now. Take an example, and this is an example close to my heart because this was my favorite class, I think, in most of my university days. And it's the reason I came to Hokkaido was the influence of this class. Comparative biology, ecosystems of Hokkaido and New England. Now, the mediator, the teacher saying, hi, in our class, you will improve your English and also become social agents co-constructing knowledge about biology and ecosystems in two areas of the world. Now, the student is saying, huh, forget it. I just need the two credits. I just want to graduate. Now, you can see here that the teacher and the student may have a different idea of what needs to be mediated. If the teacher is a good teacher, 
um, and a skillful teacher, the teacher is going to um, give the student what they need. They're going to give them, the they're going to make the two credits possible, not too difficult. Let them graduate, help, help them to graduate. But they're also going to try to hook them with this fascinating information about, in English, about uh, the ecosystems of Hokkaido and New England. And uh, that's my, my teacher in back in university in the 1970s did it all in English, um, but essentially um, CLIL teaching all in English is, uh, that would be hard CLIL where the language, there wasn't any English, there wasn't much English language training necessary except for the foreign students um, or the ESL students in the class. But it's basically the same task. Teaching CLIL is mostly mediation from a content point of view and also from a language point of view. Now, what do you want to teach or test? What languages are accessible? These are the, 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 the things we really need to think about when we, des we design prompts for um, media using mediation and language and, and contact and, uh, and content. So if we want to focus on both production and reception for skills use of language, then language A and language B should probably be the same language. English information in, English information out. If we want to mostly pr produce on focus on production, speaking and writing, if we use the student's um, first language, a more accessible language than the target language of English, we can pump them with more easily accessible information, content information, than if we, if the language in is also English and or the target language. And reverse, if the focus is on reception, listening and reading, then we'll probably want to have the students listen to the target language and produce something in um, that shows they, they, their receptive skills were adequate in either the, the, the um, L1 or the target language, it doesn't matter. But the target language task will most likely be less complex in terms of content uh, and, uh, and uh, expression than the other accessible language, for example, the student's language, uh, native language or language one. So if we think of the input and output, which, which will we focus on in our our learning task, our content or our language learning task. And we have these options in, in choosing what is language A and what is language B. Um, what do you want to teach or test? What content should be accessible? What separate level task import or output is best? So um, there's so many things to be that are involved in a CLIL. Um, uh, in, a, in a CLIL uh, class. Content knowledge, skills, what kind of text do you use? Um, is the text going to be the student's own experience or an experience they had in the past? Um, uh, if I was teaching history, in history, I want my students to think about gender expectation, gender expectations being constructed, not set in stone and changing over time. So gender expectations uh, change over time, and they change with socioeconomic situations. So now gender expectations can be a very complex topic. So in this case, and in another case, it would be different. I want my students to have that rich sort of input from their grandparents and to interview one of their grandparents about their dreams for the future when they were my student's age, which is about 20. How are the dreams different than yours today? How have things changed since that time? I'm gonna also have my students look on the internet for information and, and other sources as well. But the, the main thing is I think the grandparents 
experience and knowledge will make this whole concept of gender expectations much more real than just reading something out of a book. So um, I'm not going to say interview your grandparents. The target language in my class is English. I'm not going to tell them, interview your grandparents in English and write an English report. Uh, the grandparents probably, even if they could speak English, might feel more comfortable speaking about their personal experiences in Japanese. So my students interview their, their grandparents in Japanese and they produce the port, report in English. And they show their, their, um, uh, uh, their uh, classmates and classmates discuss how uh, their grandparents experience was the same or different from the other students. Now, this is basically thinking about using the target language and the students access, access, accessible other languages for the uh, purpose of the overall educational task. And in this case, I'm putting the emphasis for the for the um, language production part of my CLO uh, uh, task on producing something in the target language English. So um, this could change. Um, everyone has a different idea of um, of what's important, and um, every task is different. What's the, what, what are the goals of the task? In this case, I have them write 400 words in English in the Moodle forum, and the part in red is the most important part. And then I have them read their classmates' posts and make a comment on it or ask them a question. Now, I, this, most of my students find this task really meaningful and they really enjoy it. But if I didn't put the five points, they would probably never get around to doing it. So I have to consider a lot of things. Remember in my previous, uh, generic um, task produ uh, production slide, I showed you the student says, oh, I don't care about biology, I just want to graduate. That's also something we have to think about when we do a mediated task, task in education. Um, so there's lots of things to consider. Now, as I said before, um, Sefer tends to focus on communication. And how can we so-called, I would say, sephirize um, a task challenge? This is going to be just a productive, um, uh, could say, a, a, a task on a task even. Write the names of five fruits. And this is maybe beginning A1 or pre-A1. Um, so that's just a, that's a non-sephirized task. It's not communicative. Okay, this is how we sephirize the task. We create a situation, it's a real world situation where the student has to respond in their mind, imaginary, imaginary situation. The student has to re respond with communication, not just the list. You receive a line message from your homestay mother. Hi, I'm shopping. Please tell me five fruits that you like and don't like. So then the student has to write not just the names of fruits, but I like apples, I don't like bananas, or something like that. It, um, and the student has the idea in their head that they have to do this this way, not because they were asked to use a certain kind of grammar, but because this communication of I like nutty nutty, I don't like something, is central. The communication is central. How can we take that a step forward and uh, make it mediation? Okay, your real, this is a bit much, but your real mother is picking out you up from homestay tomorrow. You receive a message from your homestay mother. Hi, I'm shopping. Please tell me five fruits that your mother likes and doesn't like. What we see now is that the, the person answering the question, the child answering the question, or the, the um, daughter or son, is mediating between their mother and their homestay mother. Now, this is um, oversimplified, and it's a, it's exaggerated just to to put through a point that when we're developing prompts for um, for Sefer, it's really important to focus on the active communication uh, part of 
what the students can do or cannot do from a separate point of view. Uh, now, also, if this was a pre-A1 task, um, your real mother is picking you up from home state tomorrow. You receive a land message from your home state mothers saying, um, the directions are more complex than most pre-A1 or A1 students can, can uh, deal with easily. So this, the directions may have to be in the target language, okay? Possibly even the message might have to be in the target language if the task, the original task of being able to list fruit names is the most important thing, is a, le is a level of the, of, the, of the task. So um, forgive me for the oversimplification, but I think it makes the point uh, that when we create uh, task prompts, for language learning or for content learning. Um, to a certain extent, we have to use, we have to think about what our students can understand in terms of the directions of the task as well as what they can produce. And um, the Sefer mediation scales encourage us to think about using all the language accessible to the students, not just the target language. Um, so we think of assessment as formative, summative. How do we assess? Why do we assess? Is the assessment reliable, valid? Why does it matter? Um, how would you deal with this as an answer to a test question? Your real mother is picking you up from home state tomorrow. You receive a land message from your mother, homestay mother. Hi, I'm shopping. Please tell me five fruits that your mother likes and doesn't like. Mother like apple. Mother likes banana. Mother like pine. Mother loves steak. Okay. Now, of course, how you assess this depends on what you intended to get from the students, what you intended to assess from the students. If it was originally... Can the student list, a, um, list five fruits? Apple, banana, pine, and steak. Well, pine is, uh, how, would, is how you say pineapple in Japanese. And steak is not, a, is, is not a fruit. So would you use this for a summative assessment? Or if you did, how would you grade it? Um, we have examples here of two of two fruits are listed. In grammar, mother like apple is mm, a little off. Mother likes banana. Um, at least it should be bananas. Mother like pine. Uh, we have the verb and also a Japanese word instead of pineapple. Mother loves steak. Love is much higher on the um, complexity level than like, but steak is not a, is not a, a fruit. So I, I, I can't answer the question. How do we assess? Why do we assess? Is it reliable, valid? Why does it matter? It matters because sometimes the assessment is important to the student or the institution. But if we're doing formative assessment from this uh, red text answer, we get a lot of information about the student. If we do this as a summative assessment, it might not be so, so good, but that can be adjusted by depending on how you, um, how you, what, what kind of rubric you use to uh, think about students' answers. So tasks in general, if you want to design prompts for uh, clue mediation tasks, you have to think about prompts and the tasks. Tax, tasks should be designed to develop knowledge or skills directly related to the goals of the CLO class syllabus. This is especially true if um, it's hard sell, CLO. Hard CLO will mostly be with content knowledge. Um, into the, the content knowledge is not so important if you're going to soft, more towards soft skill or language learning, but then, um, it would be um, language ability or language use. You might even focus on grammar and uh, vocabulary use. 
but tasks should be communicated with an emphasis on the mediation of texts between groups. This is the difference between list five fruits or, you know, your mother is, is visiting your homestay and blah, blah, blah. Task mediation can be based on groups naturally occurring in the classroom or in simulated scenarios. If I were doing the fruit thing, I, would, I could say to little Susie, little Susie, ask little Johnny, tell me, little Susie, tell me five fruits that little Johnny likes. Or it could be imaginary homestay mothers. Tasks should have a focus on the L2, but also make use of other languages the students have access to, or in, to engage the knowledge of the students or, or skills from the students' experience as necessary. Now, this could be um, grandmother's experiences uh, in their dreams at 20, or it could be the kid knows what fruits their mother likes. So ideally, tasks should also facilitate student growth in creative and critical thinking, as well as intercultural community competence. Um, does the fruit example do this? Well, it can. It can bring out creative and critical thinking. Um, one thing is look at looking at the answers in the text and thinking about the difference between like, likes and loves. Another thing could be um, look at this answer and find one thing that is not a fruit. Oh, a steak. Um, so it can, it can be um, the critical and creative thinking can, can focus on vocabulary or uh, meaning, steak or fruit. It can focus on so many different things. In the case of the grandparents in their dreams at 20, it uh, has a very, very clear um, uh, focus on what is the difference between your grandparents' days and the dreams that were possible for them and your days and the dreams that are possible for you. What's the difference between Japan 50 years ago and Japan now? So how to include mediation? Get your students to teach something or introduce something to the class. For example, about their grandparents or what fruits their mother likes. How to evaluate? Evaluate how well they taught something, but whatever you decide to, how you decide to evaluate, forearm the students with good prompts and maybe rubrics. The prompts and rubrics should explain clearly what the task is and what success in the task involves. So um, with, with that, I'll leave you with uh, my references and um, I'll go quickly through this, just show you can freeze the frame. These are taken um, from um, Dendrinos and her group in Greece that have been using mediation with uh, Greek language and also with um, English in the national um, text. And the appendix, um, Sefer mediation descriptors are available online. They're in, in a Sefer companion volume, which um, I believe was introduced in 2018 and published in 2019. So thank you very much. Um, it's a long presentation, uh, but I hope that it was uh, useful in some way. And if you'd like to contact me, feel free to do that through um, the uh, comments on YouTube. Goodbye.